Section 11.3 is all about hypothesis testing for two sample means when we have paired data. Here is your page, your summary page that tells you everything you need to know. And what I'm going to tell you about section 11.3 is that those of you who like to do everything by hand, I'm not going to go through that with you in this video. And the reason for that is there is just so much that you have to calculate that if you honestly tried to do it all by hand, there are a billion places where you could make a mistake. And so it just makes so much more sense to use Excel. So I apologize if you really like to do everything by hand. I'm sure the textbook does have an example for you. Um, I find it just to be more complicated. So here's your summary page. We're going to check the conditions. The samples are random and dependent or paired. We don't know either population standard deviation. Again, either both N1 and N2 are greater than or equal to 30 or both are nearly normal. This is a T model as well. And the degrees of freedom of the T model is just N minus one, where N represents the number of pairs of data. So remember, this is going to be like a before and after situation. So even though there's going to be more than N pieces of data, there's going to be N pairs of data. Now, all of the things that need to be found, and this is again why we're going to use Excel, because there's just a lot of ways to make a mistake, is the mean of paired differences. So we need to essentially find all of the differences. So take the second pair of data, and this is key. This is key whether you're doing this by hand or not. To find the differences, you take the second observation minus the first observation. Please put a big star next to that so that you remember, because the biggest mistake I see people make is putting them in the wrong order. So second minus first. And then again, the mean of paired differences would basically be finding all of the differences and then finding the average. The test statistic or t-score is going to be whatever we find for our mean of paired differences minus the hypothesis, hypothesized differences, divided by the square or the standard deviation of the differences divided by the square root of n. So even though d bar is not difficult to find, this guy right here, deceptively difficult. Because again, several, several, several columns where we would have to find all of the deviations of each value from our mean and then square it and then divided by the square root of one or divided by n minus one and then take the square root and that's the standard deviation and then plug that value into find a t-score. So shoo, do yourself a favor and don't do that. Um, and then of course, still the critical value, still the p-value, still the same way to draw a conclusion. I'm going to do two examples with you. And again, what we're going to do is read the question together, reason through the things that we need to know, and then go straight to Excel. Um, again, we're not gonna be doing any of this by hand just because there are a lot of ways to make mistakes. So the standard course at a local defensive driving school includes several films depicting violent car crashes. And the driving school has shown these videos for many years, believing they reduce the student's average speed on a highway. A group of concerned citizens feel these videos are disturbing and are not convinced the videos reduce highway speeds enough to make a significant difference. In fact, the group claims these videos reduce a person's speed on the highway by less than five miles per hour on average. So let's stop right there for just a minute. This is the most difficult part of this particular question because it's kind of worded weird. The null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis are the hardest to come up with. So we're saying that the mean difference is going to be equal to negative five. Why? We're talking about the fact that it's going to reduce a person's speed on the highway by less than five miles per hour on average. So you would think that then the mean difference would be less than negative five would be the alternative hypothesis. But if you really think about that, that doesn't make sense because if the mean difference was less than negative five, that would mean the reduction was by really more than five. 
right? Because values that are less than negative 5 are things like negative 6, negative 7, negative 8, and so on. So really, because we're using the negative value instead of positive, we're going to say the mean difference is greater than negative 5 as our alternative. Now, of course, we could have said the mean difference is equal to 5, and then the mean difference is less than 5. Um, but here's the reason why we can't do that. Remember when we talked about how we're finding the differences. We're going to take the second speed minus the first speed. We said this is what we're going to do for each difference. And then we're going to find the average of those differences. So if the second speed is less than the first speed, then we're going to get a negative value. And that's what we want, right? Because we want those numbers to decrease. So again, this is the hardest part to get around on this particular question. Most of the time, they're not that difficult. Uh, but this is what we're going to go with, because if we used positive 5 using this, that would mean that the, this is a plus sign, not a T. That would mean that these values are going to be positive, and we don't want that to happen. We don't want the second speed to be greater than the first speed, um, because then that would mean that they're actually increasing speed. So the videos really suck. Okay, hopefully that made sense. So cross this guy out, and on we go. So the group claims these videos reduce a person's speed by less than five miles per hour on average. To test the claim, the citizens install EDRs on the vehicles of 10 volunteers. Um, and again, that's going to be N. The number of um, pairs of data is going to be equal to 10. And so they're going to drive for two weeks, they're going to watch the videos, and then they're going to drive for another two weeks after they've watched the videos, and they're going to compare, essentially is what they're saying. Uh, just because I don't want to read all of this to you. So if you need to read, pause, read, play. So again, the reason that this is a paired test is because this is the same person before, and then that person's going to watch the video, and then the same person after, and so we're looking at paired data or dependent data. So that's everything we need to know except, of course, our level of significance. So using this, let's move on to Excel and talk about how to set it up. This is the actual data that we're going to use in Excel. And again, if you're following along with us, you may open the Chapter 11 Excel data spreadsheet so that you can have access to this data as well. All right, we're moving on to Excel. Again, we did not do this one by hand. We are only doing it in Excel. The good news is, once you have Excel set up properly, these don't take long at all because Excel is doing literally all of the work for you. The only things that I need to input into Excel is the data, which this is my first set and this is my second set. The alternative hypothesis, just as a reminder, less than, greater than, or not equal to. The hypothesized difference and the alpha level. Everything else is going to be found for me, and here's how. The first and most important thing is column C. Column C is going to be our differences, because remember, that's what we're dealing with is paired data, and so I'm really just concerned about column C. And the most important thing about column C is that we are taking the second observation minus the first. So B1 minus A1, B2 minus A2. And you can see that that's what I have here in these cells. Now the easiest way to do that is to do it once and drag it down for as many pieces of information as you have. You do not want to continue past this because if I end up with zeros, notice I now have an N of 24 and I don't want an N of 24. I want just the 10 values that I'm using. So that's the first thing is to make sure C is set up correctly. Now the mean of differences, standard deviation of differences, and N are all based on C. So I'm going to use the average of column C for the mean of differences, the standard deviation of the sample of column C for the standard deviation of differences, and the count of C. And then of course the degrees of freedom here is just the number of pairs minus one, and this represents the number of pairs, so 10 minus one is nine. Now let's move on to our test statistic. Uh, oops, it says Z-score, but that is a lie, it is T-score. 
So my t-score is found by taking the observed differences, which is F4 in my case, minus the hypothesized difference, which is F2, and then dividing that, notice I've closed those parentheses, dividing that by the standard deviation of differences divided by the square root of n. And again, that gives me my t-score. Then I'm going to look at my critical value. My critical value is either t inverse of alpha degrees of freedom, t inverse of one minus alpha degrees of freedom, or for two-tailed, t inverse two-tailed of alpha degrees of freedom. For p-values for each, it's t-dist, the t-score degrees of freedom, t-dist right, t-score degrees of freedom, t-dist two-tail, t-score degrees of freedom. So we can see there's a pattern here. Again, you know how I like to use Excel to make the conclusion for me so I don't have to think about it. So if p is less than alpha, we reject, otherwise we fail to reject, and I do that for all three. That takes care of the test. And then we're going to look at E, which is the margin of error. So this is my one-tailed margin of error, which is found by taking the right critical value only because it's positive. Obviously, this one's negative. So we're going to stick with the positive one, and we're going to take it times the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. And we're going to do the same for the two-tailed margin of error, which is just a different uh, critical value. And then our intervals. Notice I don't have a uh, point estimate column, and again, that's because the point estimate has already been found, and that is the mean of differences. So F4, it looks like, minus I6, F4 plus I6, two-tailed, I'm just using this value instead, F4 minus K6, F4 plus K6. So have I actually done the test? Yes. Have I talked about what it means? No. So with P, oops, sorry, with, watch out for that spell check because it doesn't happen in a text box. With P equals 0 0.043 less than alpha, I reject the null hypothesis. At the 5% level of significance, there's evidence that after watching the videos, the mean reduction in highway speeds is less than, I forgot the five, five miles per hour on average. We believe the true reduction in speed, again, this was a one-tailed test, so I'm looking at this interval, the true reduction in speed to be between 2.21 miles per hour and 4.93 miles per hour. Since the hypothesized value of five does not fall in the interval, this supports rejecting the null hypothesis. For our second question, let's take a look at Dr. Zhang, a clinical psychologist, wishes to test the claim that there is significant difference in a person's adult weight if he is raised in an urban setting versus a rural setting. Uh, I apologize if I pronounced that incorrectly. Dr. Zhang knows the five sets of identical twin boys who were raised separately, which I think is just <laughs> kind of disturbing. Um, five sets of identical twin boys who were raised separately, one in an urban setting and one in a rural setting, and who are willing par to participate in the study to help her test the claim. The following table lists the results. Do the data support Dr. Zhang's claim at the 0 0.01 level of significance? Assume the distribution of the paired differences is approximately normal. So again, I just want to point out that this is going to be paired data because they are twins. And so that means they have the same mother, they have the same father, they have the same genetics. And so there is going to be some sort of relationship between those weights. And that is why we're using a paired test. Entering the data into Excel and not making any other changes, except for, of course, just entering the data, changing the alternative hypothesis, hypothesis the hypothesized difference, because we would expect that there not to be a difference in weights, and then the alpha level. Everything else is calculated for me, so really all I have to do is interpret what it is that I have found. So this is a two-tailed test because the question itself asks for a difference, and so I'm looking over here at the two-tailed column. And obviously I get a quite high p-value and a conclusion because p is greater than alpha to fail to reject the null. So what does that mean? Well, I've written it all out for us. With P very high compared to alpha, I fail to reject the null hypothesis. 
At the point zero one level of significance, there's insufficient evidence that the alternative is true. And the alternative says that they will weigh different. So there's insufficient evidence that the twins raised in different settings will be a different weight. The true mean difference in weight between twins raised in a rural setting versus their urban twin is between, and again this is two-tailed, so I'm looking at the two-tailed interval, is between 21.6 pounds less to 18.4 pounds more. Since the hypothesized value of zero falls in the interval, this supports failing to reject the null hypothesis. Coming up next, we're going to take a look at hypothesis testing for two sample proportions.